typing. I am going mute now. Welcome to the show. I'm your host, Mike LaRose. It's a great day to be sober, and it's a great day to be in recovery. There's probably no better time in the history of the world to be in recovery than right now. And if you're in a major metro area like Phoenix, and you're looking for recovery sources, and you haven't found them, that's probably your own fault because there's so many resources out there and so much help right now and so many things to do in recovery that um, it's just amazing. So, and I don't know about you, but I didn't get sober to sit on the sidelines and watch the world go by. I want to get in the game. And uh, tonight's guest is someone who, uh, when I look at him, I think this guy is really living life to the fullest. He's, um, he's involved. He's doing extreme endurance events. He's uh, making a difference in his community. And uh, he's just like an inspiring guy to me. So uh, without further ado, he's a man, he's a beast, he's a powerhouse of recovery, Tim Westbrook. How you doing, Tim? Hey, uh, I, I'm good, Mike. I'm good. Thanks for, uh, thanks for having me. I, I appreciate it. Yeah, yeah, no doubt, man. Um, so what have you been doing the last couple of months with all the kind of stay at home stuff? How has that changed your life? Because I know you're a pretty active guy. Yeah, um, well, it's kind of, uh, it, it's, it's surreal, um, everything that has happened. And, and it was kind of crazy. So March 6th, my girlfriend and I broke up. And that, was right before, 8th, that was just right before the state. That was started. just right before. Okay. Bad, bad timing. Right? <laughs> yeah, no, it was, kind of, I mean, it's, it's, it's really crazy. Okay. March 8th, I went to the UK okay. with, a, with a sober companion client. So one of our residents um, also ha is working with one of our coaches and, um, and our coach was having problems with his, with his passport. So I was like, I'll go. So yeah, why not? So yeah, why not? So I go to the UK. So we're in the UK from the 8th to the 13th, like right as this whole COVID thing is blowing up. I mean, it was just like, you couldn't have timed it more perfectly. Um, I was, we would have come back on March 15th, but we came back on March 13th because I had a triathlon scheduled on March 15th in San Diego. So we scheduled to come back uh, March 13th. I was going to fly to San Diego on March 14th, triathlon March 15th. So we come back on the 13th. It was a visa extension trip. So the, the guy that I was with, he, he's not a, a, an American citizen. They cut off um, the... They, they cut the borders or they um, restricted access back into the U.S. to only U.S. citizens on March 14th. So it was kind of like, you know, from the start of it, you know, break up with my girlfriend, go to the U.K., pandemic hits, hits everything. Um, we come, we barely, I mean, like we literally barely make it back to the U.S. And, um, you know, it seemed like the whole entire world came to a screeching halt for a couple of weeks. Right. Um, and so the triathlon was canceled then. Was the <laughs> yeah. The triathlon thing? was canceled. Of course. Yeah. <laughs> Needless yeah. to say the Needless triathlon to... was canceled, yeah. but we got back, we were safe. Oh. Um, one of the, so one of the treatment centers that we work with in old town uh, PCS who sends us probably three to six clients every single week for their outpatient program. Their clients come from all over the country, actually all over the world. And, um, and they went to completely telehealth. So that, so, so that um, referral source came to, you know, completely stopped. Um, we, we get quite a few clients from, from the meadows and just people like our clients are typically people that fly in from all over the country. So that kind of came to, because people aren't flying, right? So, yeah, yeah. so everything is just completely slowed down um, business-wise. But for me personally, I, you know, it's like I still, um, you know, I, I get up early in the morning. I do breath work. I pray. I meditate. I, I have a red light. I do red light therapy. Um, I run. I bike, I hike. 
So, so it hasn't slowed you down as far as what you're doing for your workouts and physically not really no, much of a change. No, not really. I mean, like I, I, I like doing yoga and I go to the gym every once in a while, but I mean, I've been, the weather's been gorgeous in Phoenix. So, I mean, I just yeah. feel so, so lucky to, to live in such an amazing place. And it's like, and next thing you know, I don't know if you notice this, but next thing you know, I swear I've never seen so many runners out on the road. Yeah, absolutely. It's like all the gyms are closed, so everybody's running. Yeah. There's people hiking. I remember we went, uh, myself and a few of the residents decided to go up to the, the 32nd Street hike on um, 32nd Street in Lincoln. And I swear I've never seen so many people on that trail, like ever. You know, it's it's like everybody was... So everybody was still out, out doing, so, I mean, it's like restaurants have been closed. Mm -hmm. um, meetings are, have, have gone to zoom. So there's really no in-person meetings, but I've got a handful of guys that I spend a lot of time with. So, um, you guys, are you mean like friends of yours that you are in recovery with? Or? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Just friends of mine that, that yeah. are in recovery that yeah. like to, to run and, and, and bike. And, um, I went, went out to, um, Canyon Canyon Lake and did a lake swim. I mean, like it was that the recreation area was closed. So, I mean, the, the boat, the lake was off limits to boats for the most part. So we kind of had, had the entire lake to ourselves. It was gorgeous. Nice, so, I nice. mean, I, 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 it's like, I've been making the most of it. I'm, I'm still doing the things I'm staying connected to people in recovery. Um, I'm doing some Zoom meetings here and there, um, you know, just hanging out with a, with a handful of people, really. Nice, nice. Okay, so, well, have you always been into fitness or was that kind of a thing that um, started with sobriety or how did that work? Um, I mean, I, I was kind of into fitness when I was younger, but, but, but not really. And um, like for me, I, I, I got you know, I got, I got sober, um, March 8th, 2011. And then, and, and as you know, getting sober is more than just stopping drinking and stopping doing drugs. There's way right. more to That's, it. Right. Yeah. Cause we've got all these behaviors and all of these habits that we got it. We need to change. Like we need new lifestyle habits and new behaviors to replace all of our old behaviors because we drank and we did drugs to soothe the pain, right? So it's like whenever we were going through some a difficult time or we were happy or we were sad or we were depressed, we, we went to drugs and alcohol. So because I no longer do drugs and I don't drink, I had to replace those behaviors. And so I started, I, I started doing yoga in, in July of 2011. I remember I went to the Bikram yoga studio up at Thunderbird and Tatum. I went there, you know, for a couple of days in a row. And then, that was, that was when Bikram was like in its heyday, right? About yeah, that time. yeah, exactly. Was, exactly. Yeah. And then, and then I started going to uh, Sumit's yoga. Sumit's hmm. yoga was at, at town and country. I started going there. There was a place called 360 spin at, um, like 36th and Indian school, I started going there. So like I was literally, you know, I, I, I was going to a lot of meetings. I mean, I really just dove into recovery and, and completely changed my life. Right. Who, who uh, turned you on to yoga? Was that just like you woke up one day and thought it'd be a good idea or was there like an inspiration for that? Maybe no, a, hot, a hot young lady who's <laughs> enticed you or and no, no, uh, I, I, I just, a couple of my friends, a couple of my friends in recovery were, okay. were doing yoga. And so that's kind of, so that was, I think most guys have this kind of level. A lot of guys have a perception that it's like not macho or something, you know, to do yoga. And the, I think it's what, like 75, 80% women, I think are in the it used yoga to population. Be. It, it used to it be. Used to, it's not anymore. It's yeah. not anymore. I mean, it's, it's, I mean, it's probably 40, 60. Um, okay. I'd say, I mean, there's way more, I mean, when I, for in 2011, yeah, I mean, it was way more, way more females. And um, I started doing yoga three or four times a week. I was doing spin three or four times a week. 
I remember on Saturday morning, my Saturday morning routine was I'd go to the Saturday morning on awakening at, at Valley press at 7 AM. Mm. And then I'd go and I'd do spin at nine o'clock or eight. It was either eight 30 or nine o'clock. And then I'd go upstairs and they had uh, yoga and I would do yoga. So I do back to back. So that was kind of when I really, really started getting into the, the fitness thing. And, and, and so yoga spin, and then I started doing CrossFit. I joined uh, Cactus CrossFit, which was on Indian school in, in Goldwater. And then I started going to fit. Repo- I mean, there's just, you know, it's, it's, it's my, kind of a, a snowball of fitness effect, huh? You just yeah, kept adding, yeah. and it's, adding more and more things as you went. Yeah. Yeah. And it's, it's, you know, again, it's like my, my lifestyle completely changed mm-hmm. and these were all healthy, healthy, um, like healthy activities, healthy right. hobbies. I had to find new healthy activities. I needed to find new things to do. Like I didn't need, I didn't need to spend all day, every day at meetings. Right. right. Yeah. And, and, and so with all of these other activities like yoga and CrossFit and spin, um, there are people that are in recovery. I mean, it was like, those were all compliments to my recovery. And um, because before I got clean and sober, my activities were, you know, I had season tickets to the, to the Arizona Cardinals. I, um, you know, it's like going to concerts, going to, going to bars. It's like all of my activities revolved around drinking right. and doing, you know what I mean? So you, I mean, it sounded like you were kind of had fun when you were drinking too, but so kind of talk a little bit about that, like your drinking history and kind of how that turned into something not so good. And you, you know, until you hit your bottom. Um, okay. So gosh, where do I start? Um, <laughs> Seven years old. Uh, yeah, right. Exactly. I mean, like, first off, I was always a bad kid. I mean, no, I, I, I can't. Up, I can't. That's hard to believe. Yeah, yeah. Right. I was. I mean, I was. I was awful. I mean, I remember when I was uh, when I was really young. I would I would steal candy from the store. I remember getting caught stealing. Uh, I think a, a cap gun from like thrifties or something like that. Um, when I was a uh, when I was in sixth grade, I was the class president of my elementary school and me and my friends stole computers <laughs> nice. and we got, and I got caught. Oh. And, and so I got expelled from, from my school. I, I had to resign. I got, exp- I mean, it's just like, you know, then my parents got, and I, and, and, I and where up, did you go to school? Was that in, you're from California originally, right? Yeah. Or, yeah. Or, um, Orange County. So I was Orange County. Okay. Year. So yeah, you're in a kind of a happening hip area there, huh? Yeah, yeah. I was I so I was born in Whittier, grew up in Cerritos. My parents got divorced between sixth and seventh grade. Hmm. And then so my mom took us up to Oxnard, which is about two hours away, um, just north of Santa Monica, south of Ventura. And I ended up going to a, a school in Rio in El Rio. And it was kind of uh like I grew up in an area that was heavily um, Asian and like middle, upper middle income. And then Oxnard was predominantly Hispanic and like middle, like middle, lower middle income. And, you know, it's like, I'm in seventh grade. So in seventh grade, that's a tough time. That's a tough time in a, in a, in a guy's life. And so I go and I'm like this white kid and I've got new clothes and, um, I'm in this, this new school with, kids that don't have new clothes. I mean, it's just like, so I appeared to be like the rich kid, even though I wasn't rich. I just, I had new clothes. I had new things. And so I'm trying Rel- to relative in. to your classmates, you were doing pretty well. And then right, your, or your right. parents were. And, and so I remember that that's when I started smoking pot. Um, I started drinking. I started, I mean, in eighth grade, I think I did, I did acid. I did mushroom. I mean, like, like I started young. And then when I was a sophomore in high school, I was smoking weed every day and I was getting in trouble. And then I, gosh, I don't even know if I want to go into this. I mean, there's just like, there's just so many. So I I ended up getting in trouble in Oxnard and I had to go to my, I had to go to school 
I had to move to my dad's. I got in so much trouble, I had to move to my dad's. And then I was really smoking pot every single day and just like not, um, you know, I was not doing well. Like I wasn't doing well in school. I was ditching school. I remember I decided not to play soccer because instead I wanted to work, which is like the stupidest thing in the world. Cause like I didn't need to work, you know, were you, my, good, were you good at soccer or was that? Yeah. Yeah. yeah I was good so you, at soccer. Yeah. And, but I was, I was smoking pot every day. So, <laughs> I mean, you know, that was, that was not going to, and, and actually it was a really good soccer team. It was Cerritos high school. It was a really good soccer team. So I went to Cerritos High School for one semester, and then I came clean that to my parents, I was like, I'm, I'm smoking pot every day. Like, this is not good for me. I need to go back to Oxnard. So stopped smoking pot, went back to Oxnard. So it's almost like that was when I, I like the first time I kind of knew I had a problem. But, you know, I, so I stopped smoking pot and then went Went to school at Oxford High, junior year, senior year. I drank a lot, but I was in honors classes. I played football. I was popular. Um, and, you know, I blacked out all the time, but I was like still getting good grades, still playing football, still playing baseball. I was still like, I, I, had, I was able to hold everything together. Then I went to school at UC Davis. That's and, a pretty uh, good school. So your grades were then pretty good too, or did... Did you yeah. have enough, any athletic no, scholarship? Grade, I, mean, or I only anything, had or? one bad semester <laughs> like, <Yeah. laughs> when I was in at Cerritos high school, which was that, that high school was way harder than Oxnard. And, mm -hmm. and I was smoking pot every day and hanging out with the wrong people. So back to Oxnard. Yeah, I had good grades. Um, I was taking honors classes. Um, and I, I got recruited to play football at UC Davis. And then uh, went up to UC Davis and, and just kind of drank a lot. I mean, I drank a lot. I blacked out all the time. Mm. I, I mean, I still was doing okay in school. And then- How about the football? How did that go? I broke my leg between, between my senior year, the summer before I went to school at UC Davis. So I, I wasn't able to, to, to suit up at all or go to practice. And I just went straight to drinking. I, I didn't even, I, I never played. I never played. I never practiced. I never went to one single, I never did any of that. I never um, pursued did, that at did all. Did you break your leg while you're playing or was that a drinking thing? No, <laughs> <laughs> no. I broke my leg at the wedge in Newport, in Newport beach, huh. skimboarding. Okay. And a wave crashed on my leg. A wave crashed on your leg. So a wave crashed on my leg, uh -huh. broke it. Um, that must have been some wave to break your leg. It the well the wedge is in Newport. Be it's a place in Newport Beach that has massive shore break. Okay. And so um, the wave, I was I was skimboarding and I was going pretty fast, and a wave broke right on my leg, and I you know flipped over and. I remember just kind of dragging myself up to the sand. And I remember I was actually down there for Lollapalooza. So we went to Lollapalooza. I went and got a cane from like the drugstore. Mm. And we went to Lollapalooza anyways. And I just drank enough to where my leg didn't hurt anymore. And then <laughs> went into Lollapalooza. I didn't went two days in a row. And then went to the doctor and got a cast after that so so i did that uh, um so back to uc so back to uc davis and um my sophomore year okay so i started um so there was this intern so my freshman year at the end of my freshman year there was this uh this this painting this internship where you could learn how to run a business. You run a house painting business over us over the summer. You do all of your own sales and marketing and advertising and recruiting and interviewing them. I mean, basically you run your own business. And so I did that. So it was called student works painting. So my freshman year that summer, I ran a house painting business and the whole, the, like everything behind that, that, like the culture of that company was drink hard, play hard. 
And if it's going to happen, I'm going to make it happen. And so, so I ran a painting business. I knocked on lots of doors. I got doors slammed in my face. Like I worked my ass off and I did really well. Um, I did really well that first summer. And then the next spring, so that was the summer of 95. And then the next spring, April 19th, 1996, picnic, it was picnic day at UC Davis, which is like a big, just, um, it's just a big party. And I got super wasted and I don't remember anything. And I tried to drive home 400 miles away. <laughs> yeah. Um, <laughs> That's, this so, sounds like a, this is going to have a bad ending. I, I yeah. Sensing a yeah. bad ending coming here. Yeah. So, so I fell asleep driving. I flipped over three times, um, got flown lifeline to over to San Jose medical center. I was in ICU for four days, 24 hour care for 28 days, transitional living center for brain injured adults for six weeks, disability classes for six weeks. Like it was bad. I don't remember. And so you were, anything. you were driving alone that you were alone in the car. Yeah. And you just, you just went off the road and flipped. I fell. Yeah. I fell asleep. You fell asleep. There was somebody yeah. behind me that, I mean, it was like four o'clock in the morning okay. and they were saying it was on the five going down South. It was in uh Santa Nella, right by pea soup Anderson's. And somebody behind me saw me flip over three times and you know, they called 911 and they, they flew me over to San Jose medical center and, um, again, I was, you know, ICU, 24 hour care, uh, and then transitional living center for brain injured adults. So I, like I, I was, it was, it was Matt. I mean, it was really, really bad. Yeah. You're lucky. To, you're lucky you survived it, huh? Yes. Yeah. yeah. You look at the car, you're like that person didn't live. And, and, and so for two weeks, I don't remember anything it probably took me two years to recover. Like mentally, I was, I was slow. It was, I mean, they never, they never, uh, they didn't know if I was ever going to come back to, to, you know, they didn't know if I, if I was ever going to come back, you know, it's like one day I'm five years old. One day, one day I'm 18 years old. The next day I'm 56 years old. I mean, it was just like nonsense coming out of my mouth and that, yeah, I was, it was a traumatic brain injury. Um, and then I remember I fought, they said I was never going to go back to school at UC Davis. And I remember I, I fought to go back to school at UC Davis and they let me go back in the fall. And I remember how hard school was and I was, I, I now had a disability. So they gave me more time to take tests. I had to study harder. Um, it was just, everything was harder. And, um, and then the following year I ran a house painting business again. And it was, um, that was like the best thing I ever did because that was like, that was what brought me back mentally, like having to go out and knock on doors and hire employees and do sales calls and just run a business like that was just going to school. I don't think I would have, I would have come back. So that was, um, so luckily I, 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 I did that and I, and I started and I was, and I still drank, I was drinking. Um, so you never had a thought of like, uh, maybe I should, no. this, it was a bad accident. Maybe I should no. give up this drinking. No, thing. not even close. Never occurred not, to you. No, everybody said, Oh my gosh, Tim, God's the reason you're alive. I mean, and, and at that time, at that period of time in my life, I was an atheist and I didn't believe. I was like, give me a break. You know what? Like, I'm 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 lucky to be alive, but I'm alive and it's all good. And so no, I didn't stop. I mean, I kept on drinking. Um when after I graduated from college was when I started doing, doing drugs. Like I just drank and, and smoked a little bit of pot during, during college, but not really, it was mostly, mostly drinking. And I couldn't drink. And, and after the accident, um, 
for obvious reasons, I, I couldn't drink that much. Like I could not hold my liquor and I was a mess pretty quickly. And again, blackout drunk. I was very, I was really sloppy um, after the accident and I just continued drinking. And then once I got, after I graduated from college, I started doing ecstasy and I started um, doing cocaine and I started doing GHB and um, I, I overdosed on GHB several times. I ended up in the hospital several times. I actually. Well, GHP is a kind of a dangerous drug with that, isn't it? There's, I mean, as far as like the, the overdoses and the dying, there's been quite a few of those. Yeah. It's, um, it's kind of like you can take too much really easily. And I took too much a lot, like, lots of times, probably 10 times. I mean, like, I, I don't even know how many times I ended up in the hospital. And actually one of the times I ended up in the hospital, it was, I was at a company function. Um, Cause I moved, I actually ended up moving after I graduated from Davis, moved out to San Francisco. And then I moved to Southern California to Newport beach. And I helped that company student works expand down to Southern California I was living in Newport Beach. I was doing drugs. I was, uh, I remember I o overdosed on GHB multiple times. And one of the times I was at a company function, um, I got fired. And that was kind of like my life, you know, once again, you know, you've got the accident. My life was kind of came to an end. And then you've got, uh, I got fired from student works. My life came to an end. And again, it was just my drinking and my drug use. And then. So what are your friends and family? What are they telling you at this point? Are they saying anything or. Um, I not. Um, or did not you just really. kind of, did you isolate from them or did you hang out with people who are drinking like you drank and that kind of thing? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I hung out with a lot of people that like to do drugs and, and, and party. So, so that was kind of, I don't think I told them the, the real story. I don't think I told them the truth. They don't really know why I got fired from student works. I think I probably turned the story around and made it sound like it was their fault. I'm pretty sure that's probably what happened. And then I got another, and then I got another job. Well, actually, okay. So I got another job for a little while selling payrolls for like three months and I got fired. And then, um, I moved back up to Davis to start a house painting business because I knew I could run a house painting business. Cause I was in debt. I was like $55,000 in debt. Um, at that time. And, and I just, I like, I needed to make some money. So I knew I could go start a house painting business. I called my friend, Jeremy Brooks, who was a painting contractor in Northern California. I moved up to Northern. Like I remember talking to my roommate, Grant Dietz in when I lived on the peninsula in Newport beach. And I remember telling him, I said, you know, I think I'm going to go, I think I'm going to go up to Davis and start a house painting business. And he, and he kind of said sarcastically, like, okay, are you, what, are you leaving tomorrow? And I was like, um, yeah. <laughs> so, he's like, he's like relieved to have you going or what? No, I mean, no. He, I, I, no, no. I mean, I paid rent. I was a good roommate. I was fine. Okay. I paid rent. I mean, you know, I wasn't, I wasn't there very often. Mm. And um, I moved up to Davis, started a house painting business, did that, did really well with that. And again, drinking cocaine, drugs, just, but it was like, I mean, I didn't have any real friends or real relationship. I mean, it was just, I was, I was a wreck, man. I was a wreck. I, I got offered a partnership to start um, the Northern California division of college works painting, which was a competitor to student works painting but they were not in Northern, they were nationwide, but they were not in Northern California. So I took that and I did really well. I mean, my first year I did like $1.2 million, which was a record. I mean, cause 
before me, the most a startup division had ever done was like 700, 700 grand or something like that. Were you working on commission then? So you're probably doing pretty well yourself too, right? Um, but- they, I, I was 30% owner of the division. So they, so they fund, there were four general partners that funded it and mine was basically sweat equity. So I owned 30% of the division. I did really well. Year one, year two, year three, my third year, number two division in the country. But we had all of our trips in places like Cancun, Vegas, Miami, Park City. Party spots. Yeah. And I was every single time I was the most the most fucked up one of everybody. (laughs) Every single time I I mean, I remember being in Miami and going out. I mean, I don't know if you've ever been to Miami, but it starts really late. It starts later than Vegas. I mean, I can remember rolling back into the hotel at 8 a.m. And I got a meeting that starts at 9 a.m. And every single trip, I would get pulled aside. Like, Tim, we got to talk about your, we got to talk about your, your Your extracurricular activities. We got to talk about your drinking and drug use. (laughs) We got to talk about your image. Mm. And like they, I did, my division was doing really well though. So they're kind of like scratching their head and they're like, man, this guy's, you know, I was doing well, I was making money and, and I had a, 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 a really strong division. But then finally in 2005, there was a trip to Vegas followed by a trip to Cancun. I was just, it was just too much. And I remember my business partner, Matt Stewart, after getting home from Cancun, Matt uh, says, I'm going to, I, I want to fly out there tomorrow. I want to meet with you. So I met with him the next day and he said it was too much and, and they let me go. So just making the money wasn't enough. They, they were worried about their image and your behavior and everything. I was a liability, so, man. Yeah. I was a liability. I was a liability. I don't even remember that trip to Cancun. I cra- I think I slipped and fell and cracked. I mean, I still got a scar from the stitches from that trip. I mean, it was it was really bad, and um, and they fired me. And of course, I made it out to be their fault. I didn't really tell everybody the truth of what really happened, and I didn't take responsibility. I didn't want to change my behavior, um, so I owned thirty percent of the division. So. I ended up getting paid. I mean, and I flipped and it was like early 2000s and real estate market was hot. So I flipped a few homes. I made some money on a couple of homes that I flipped. So I was just, I mean, I was just, I was out of control, but I was making money. I was, I was able to like hold it together, but you know, I lost my, my, because college works was my life. That everything I did, I'm a workaholic, I'm a drug addict, I'm an alcoholic. And everything, my, my whole entire life was tied up into that company and all of my friends and everything I did and, and boom, came to an end. And then I remember we traveled across and then I, and then I had to like show everybody I was okay, right? So, so we traveled across the country, we went to Europe, I proposed to my then girlfriend, now ex-wife, um, moved to Arizona, bought a few, bought four homes in our camp. I mean, it was, you know, it's like I, I made some money. I, gosh, I don't know. I, I, so I, I bought a bunch of homes in Arcadia and then the market, and that was like 2006, 2007, 2008. Then the big crash. Yeah. The, yeah. I mean, it was just like, and I started this vacation rental company. I didn't even have a real estate license when I started it. And I started managing people's properties. And I was like, oh, I better get a real estate license. And, but I never really, I never set up a, a broke, a, um, a trust account. And so, and do you know anything about a trust account? Oh, for like uh, when you're making a, a payment for a, a house or something, is that, or? Is that okay? Yeah, I mean, basically, when somebody was going to stay in one of our vacation rentals, they would give us a deposit, and I was yeah. supposed to put that deposit in a separate account and not yeah. do anything with it right. until yeah. you know. That's kind of yeah, how the time. I mean, I built, it's kind of like a timeshare like that, where they they have a trust account. 
They put them up. Yeah, right kind of. Yeah, like attorneys have trust accounts. I mean, okay. with a trust account, the money is to be held in a separate account in trust. You don't touch that money until it's used. You don't trust that money until it's earned. It's not earned until after somebody stays in the property. So if somebody gives me a deposit, like it's it's May right now. So if somebody gives me a deposit for July and they give me a deposit, I'm not supposed to touch that deposit until after they stay with me in July because that's when it's earned. So I was, I didn't even have a trust account. I was like my, I was just, money was going everywhere. I mean, I had money coming in. Money, I mean, I was using money inappropriately, essentially. And, and I wasn't stealing money from anybody. I, everybody got paid, but I was using deposits to fund the operations of the business, which is not, it's not the right, it's not the right thing to do. Now, remember, I got sober in 2011. And, and so I, at this point, I had already, like, I was already upside down. And I remember talking to my sponsor and saying, Hey man, what do I do? Like I've got all the, you know, I'm upside down. I don't have enough money. And I remember my sponsor saying, what do you, you think you're the first person that's done this? <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, okay. And mind you again, 2011. So you've got a lot of people that are, that are, or actually, no, I'm sorry. Okay. So 2011, 2012. So, Okay, so I'm getting I'm I'm getting ahead of myself. Um, so I got sober 2011. Was there uh, kind of like a event, some kind of climax? Yes, there or, was an event. Was so first off, my ex wife and I were were like we weren't getting along. We were working together. The economy was in the toilet. Um, we weren't making money. We were working together. You know, it's like we're, we go to work, we're working, we go home, we talk about work. We're financially stressed out. I'm drinking. I'm, you know, it was just, it was not, not a good situation. And then we had a, a weekend where a couple of my buddies, my friend Sep and Sep was coming into town. And I remember Sep said, uh, he was supposed to come in with, in town with his wife. And then I was going to hang out with my wife. So it was going to be a couple's weekend. And Sep calls, or he sends me an email like a week before or a few days before the trip. And he said, Hey, um, my wife's not coming. And Cameron's coming instead. And I was like, Whoa, okay. So I tell my wife that his wife's not coming. And so now all of a sudden this couple's trip turns into a guy's weekend and she doesn't like guys weekends because guys weekends are when bad things happen bad thing tim gets in trouble with guy when he's hanging out with his buddies so he had a room at the w so we ended up staying at the w um just a, a bunch of uh, shenanigans that night um some things happened she found out um and, and she, she left me. She basically said, um, I'm leaving you. The only way I'll consider taking you back is if you never drink again, you go to rehab and you stop playing golf. I stopped playing golf. Yeah. I was like, <laughs> that's a new one. I haven't heard of that one before. Yeah. Or, I mean, I, I don't really know what the golf thing was. <laughs> I don't know what that was about, but regardless, I said, okay. I'll get sober. I'm not going to rehab. I don't understand the golf thing. And so I, I went to my very first meeting on March 8th, 2011. I went to the meeting on 42nd Street and Thomas, the birthday cake meeting. And I remember pulling into the parking lot and it was, you know, was a seven o'clock meeting. It was still light outside. And I remember pulling up and there were a bunch of guys in front and they were they were laughing and just having such a good time. And, and I was sitting in my car and I was crying and I was like, what in the world? Why are they so happy? And I went inside to the meeting. I sat down next to a guy named Michael and, and you've been to this meeting, right? You know what I'm talking about. They call newcomers to the front. 
I no, I haven't been to that meeting. No. Okay, so it, so they call newcomers to the podium, and I had never been to an AA meeting before in my life. And they called me to the front, and I remember telling the story about what happened over the weekend, and everybody laughed. They were laughing. I was crying. They were laughing. I was. I mean, and and immediately I just felt I felt so welcomed, and I I felt like you know guys came up to me. They gave me their numbers. They said, "Hey, go to ninety meetings in ninety days. Here's a big book. Call me here. What's your phone number?" Um, let me call and, and guys called me and I called them and I went to a meeting the next day. I went to Prince of Peace. I got a sponsor and, and I just kind of like, I dove in. I really just started. Um, I, I started working the steps. Like I, I did, I took all of the suggestions. It was my best. And I understood my best thinking got me where I was. And so you didn't actually then go to rehab or I did not go to rehab. No, I I mean, mind you, I was, and I think I might be a little bit different than, I mean, it's like everybody has their own path, right? I didn't go to rehab. I, I owned a business. I worked 50 hours a week. So it's not like I was trying to find a purpose, which in my opinion, somebody needs to have a purpose in order to stay clean and sober. You can't just stay clean and sober. Like there's got to, you got to have something going on in your life. So I had a full-time job. I was working 50 hours a week. Um, You know, I started doing step work. I went to meetings, you know, one or two meetings a day. And then I started doing yoga and then I started doing spin. And then I started, and so I just kind of filled my time and I made friends with people that were in recovery. I remember, um, I, I, I learned how to really connect with people. Um, I mean, my sponsor, I, I, I mean, I learned how to cry in front of other men. Mm. And so was there like a, do you remember a, like a psychic change, spiritual waking moment and what that, what, what that was like for you? Like, was there a particular idea or something that came along with that? I don't, I don't remember it being a, like a specific time it was more kind of the slow gradual thing it was gradual for me it was gradual i just you know it's like suit up show up and and really it was for for me it was the lifestyle changes it was the behavior changes it was the exercise it was the meditation it was reading upon awakening in the morning. It was calling three guys in recovery every single day. It was doing a gratitude list every single day. It was. You know, so it sounds like you, you actually followed suggestions pretty well. It sounds like so you didn't have like kind of a resistance. Like here I am the successful, I, you know, I know what I'm doing in business. I know what I'm doing here too. And I can do my own thing. You didn't have that uh, kind of feeling. No, I, I didn't. I, I full, I, I just was, I was all in. And at that time, my business was not thriving. Like I was scrambling. I was scrambling. I was not like, I was, not, I was not killing it. I was not killing it. <laughs> Definitely not. And I also remember there was a guy that I knew in Newport beach. His name was Scott. And I remember he said to me, and I was, you know, probably 28 years old. He said, you need, you just need to make friends, meaning girlfriends, like friends, just friends, like not girls to date, not girlfriends. And I, and at that time I, I didn't, I was like, what's he talking about? <laughs> Cause like it, if a girl gave me any sort of attention, I was like, she totally wants me. You know, that was what I used to think. And I mean, and, and so I didn't date for, for a year, as they say, as they recommend. And so I had lots of friends that were women. So I learned how to just have, I learned how to just be a good guy and not be sleazy and not try to hit on every single girl that smiled at me and gave me a little bit of attention, you know? Okay. So that's kind of a psychic change <laughs> oh absolutely yeah there's i mean 
I'm I'm like I'm 360 degrees or 180 degrees a completely different person. It didn't happen. It didn't happen overnight. I mean, it took a long time. And I remember when I got my five year chip, everybody said to me, I think I remember Mike Lowry said, congratulations, you're no longer a newcomer. I was <laughs> like, what? <laughs> like I've been here for five years. And, and, and I'll tell you, so some other things happened to me. I mean, I, like it wasn't, it wasn't definitely not a walk in the park for me. Like my, I got audited. Okay. Going back to my trust account, in the the my my vacation rental company in 2013 i got a call from the department of real estate they said we're going to audit you tomorrow and i said okay and they showed up and they gathered everything i got a letter from the department of real estate a month later they said we found that your trust accounts delinquent we need you to come in for an investigational interview i mean and what ended up happening was i lost my license my license was revoked I lost that business. Like everything was gone. I filed chapter seven in 2012, 2013. My real estate license got revoked. I lost my business. I had to. And this is all happening in sobriety, which makes it probably even more painful, right? Because you're kind of more aware of everything that's happening. Yeah. And, and, you know, but it's just like, I've just learned that God's in control. Tim doesn't need to be in control. So it's just, it's just, it's easy. I mean, it's not easy. It's, it's hard, but I remember going to the 6:45 AM attitude adjustment meeting and just crying. Like when I would go through these things, I would cry in front of a room full of men. And that's not something I was capable of doing when I was, before I got clean and sober, hmm. you know, I learned how to get vulnerable. I learned how to be intimate i learned how to to be real i learned how to really share my feelings and and what i was going through and that's the only reason i didn't if i would have if i would have uh put on my game face or or stuffed it or pushed it down I, there's no i don't know i don't know where i would be like i had to share that i had to share those things i've sponsored lots of men I've, um, you know, I've, I was on the board of directors of Crossroads for four years. I've chaired meetings. I've done, like, I do lots of service work. I help lots of other people. Okay. So now you own and operate Camelback Recovery, which is a group of what you have five houses now in the Phoenix? Uh, yeah, we, uh, yeah, six, six. We had eight, we had nine. But now we're down. Yeah, we've um, oh because of the recent events. As a result of COVID nineteen and um, yeah, and the, the the recent pandemic, we've closed a couple of our homes. And you know, in in two thousand nineteen, two thousand eighteen, two thousand nineteen, I just expanded too quickly, and um, yeah, we just expanded too quickly. We had too many beds. We had it's just yeah. like it was too much. And with the pandemic, so we had four homes in North Scottsdale. We closed two of them. So we've kept the two best homes in North Scottsdale. And really what was happening is that we were, we were having to fill beds with scholarships and, and, you know, so it's like we were, we were, um, like I would prefer to focus on providing excellent service. I don't want to cut corners. Our, the rates we charge, although they are higher than what other sober livings charge, the services we provide are, are above and beyond, way above and beyond what other people provide. And mm -hmm. our expenses are a lot higher. So, right. so to, um, talk about some of those services briefly, like, uh, I mean, well, I worked for you for a few months, so um, it's like three years ago. So I kind of know that, but I guess for the audience, like um, you have meals prepared every evening, right? Or five nights a week. Yeah. Or so our, so, so I, I've learned to kind of um, really, uh, I guess, um, uh, correctly talk about or describe our program. 
So our program is based upon five pillars, accountability, support, structure, community, and purpose. Everything in our program supports one of those five pillars. So it's not, um, so it's like uh, all of the food is provided, right? And food and nutrition being such an important part of recovery, it was such an important part of my recovery. It's an important part of brain recovery, gut health, and um, we need food. We need good, yeah. healthy, nutritious food. Yeah, and that's so what we, I like so much about your program. When um, I was there, was that you're like the first guy I had met in a sober living who was talking about nutrition and getting a good diet. Like they just, I mean, other places were just like you're on your own, kind of. You know, they don't really, even if they're serving food, they don't really, you know, necessarily make it nutritious. So. Yeah, and 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 I've learned, and so. What I've learned also, what I've realized anyways, is that us providing food is way more than just us providing food. It, it's, it's, you know, it's like it, pro, it promotes the community being one of our five pillars. So it's like everybody's up in the morning, they're cooking breakfast together, they're talking about their day, they're getting the day started. Um, all of the food in the house is everybody's, right? And, um, and then there's, it, which... And, and you know this, it's like when at most sober living homes, everybody buys their own food and the, what happens. And, and so it's not possible to really, if you're trying to eat healthy, you can't really eat healthy. If you're, you can't shop cost effectively if you're shopping for one person. So it's really hard to eat healthy if you're shopping for one person. And when everybody has, um, everybody buys their own food, you've got all the foods labeled, you've got all this food in the refrigerator and everybody has their little cubbies and, and you have a refrigerator full of energy drinks and hot pockets and frozen burritos. Right. <laughs> right. Yeah. Not exactly. Uh, the five food groups. Right. right. And, <laughs> and everybody steals each other's food. <laughs> right. So yeah. what you end up with is isolation, um, hostility, which is the opposite of community, right? Community, like that's how we're gonna get clean and sober, by building relationships, human connection, mm. being around people that are gonna help us, like we're all gonna lift each other up. We provide five community family style dinners per week. I mean, you know, you were one of our homes. It's like, that's it, man, that, that talking about your day, reflecting on what happened today. So, so us providing food is such, is, is one of the best things that we do. Um, yeah, and that's right. That's, there is a sense of community when you're having dinner together at the same time. Right. And rather than everyone just maybe ordering, a, some guy orders a pizza and other guys cooking some uh, ramen, you know, another guy, you know, might not be eating at all. So that, that really brings everyone together for a few minutes too. Yeah. Let's see here. What else do we do? We utilize technology assisted care. So we have an app. It's called the Camelback Accountability and Support app. That's how we track everybody's activities. Throughout so the yeah, day. so you're actually like GPS tracking them too. So you know where they are at all times. Is that? Yes. Yes. So that's is, I mean, that's a little bit invasive almost, isn't it? Or do they kind of agree? Do they agree? That's a good idea. No, they have to agree to it. They have to agree. Okay. And, and this is the thing, man. It, it sounds, it sounds invasive, it's really not. I mean, this is the thing. Like, we're not following people around. Like, they, yeah, we know where they're at, but we're not going to micromanage their schedule. We're not going to say, hey, where'd you go today, Michael? Yeah. Well, it says here on your GPS that you were in Mesa. What were you doing? What were you doing on Van Buren? I mean, it, huh. <laughs> I mean, if you're on Van Buren, but actually, we're probably, we don't even ever look at it unless we really need to look at it. And I, I, I like to say GPS tracking is, is similar to drug testing. We drug test two times a week, but the reason we drug test is not to catch them. We, drug testing is preventative, right? Like sure. you're going to get drug tested. You know, you're going to get drug tested. So therefore the, the hope is that you make the decision not to drink or not to use. Cause if we drug test you, when we think that you're high, it's too late. So that's the same thing with, with the GPS tracking. You know that we know where you're at. It just promotes honesty. That's it, man. That's all, that's all there is to it is we, you know that we know where you're at and therefore you make 
a, a decision not to go down to Van Buren just to check it out. <laughs> that sounds like one of my stories. Yeah, let's, let's go drive by the neighborhood yeah, down here, see what's happening. <laughs> yeah, let me just do a quick drive by. Right. Yeah. You know, and, and, and you know, and I know what a drive by leads to. Yeah. Yeah. Leads to, well, it lead, lead to me shooting dope, probably. You know, kind of thing, yeah, right? yeah. Yeah. Right. I mean, anybody that's, and so the, again, the, it's just, it's all about accountability. Um, you know, we provide recovery coaching, which is, you know, one of the best things that, that we provide, in my opinion, we started offering recovery coaching free of charge to people for, for two weeks. Um, just because, you know, a lot of, a lot of people don't understand. They think, uh, you know, well, I have a therapist or I have a, I have a sponsor and a recovery coach is not the same thing. I mean, it's just like with anything you do, if you have a coach that you pay, you're going to like, you're going to get better results. Um, because you're seeing s some value in it because you're paying for it. You're seeing more value in it than if it was like a, a sponsor who you're not paying for. Partially. Yes. Um, so a sponsor, like a sponsor's job is really to take a guy through the steps. A sponsor's job is related to 12 step recovery. Right. And a lot of sponsors do more than that. But a coach is, is everything it is, it's like a life coach. So it's way more than just a sponsor and a sponsor is not going to be available every single day. You know what I mean? Like my sponsees, I'm not, a, I'm not, I don't talk to my sponsees every single day. A coach is available every single day and a coach gets paid to help you find a good meeting, to help you write a resume to help you like, Hey, let's go find a job. What's the next thing we need to work on? Sure. Um, so what's the, uh, what kind of rates are you talking about there for having a recovery coach? Uh, so it starts at about a thousand dollars a month. The resident rates start at about a thousand dollars a month. Okay. And so that's like the most basic package. Yeah. Okay. That's, I mean, that's reasonable sounding to me for, I mean, that's someone you can call, every day and you spend those maybe a certain number of hours with them a week too. Yeah. There's, yeah, there, there's amount of, there's there, you're on the app. And, and so people that utilize our coaching service aren't just residents, they're residents or people that used to be residents. Like we've got a, a gal that works for us. Her, her name's Kellen. She was, um, she went to the Meadows inpatient. She went to the Meadows outpatient. She was a resident at Serenity ranch she had a coach and she kept a coach for about a year after she left serenity ranch and she's been sober for 18 months and she works for us now and it's like she had been trying to get clean and sober for a long long time so mm -hmm. the the coach is kind of like the wraparound service that protects your investment i mean a coach is just it's so much it's so much more than just uh you know, it's a, a coach is going to get with a therapist. A coach is going to communicate with your sponsor. A coach is going to communicate with a parent, with a spouse, with a loved one. It's just, it's a, it's another layer of accountability and support. Mm -hmm. Nice. Nice. Yeah. That's, and you know, that's, uh, I guess maybe because of the crowd, you the demographic you're aiming for, that's something more that there'd be a, able to afford and be interested in um, rather than maybe the typical um, sober house <laughs> resident, but yeah, uh, yeah, no. And, 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 and it's kind of, and again, one other thing I just want to mention, it's like, I know, like I have a, a triathlon coach. I mean, you know, I've been doing triathlons. I did Ironman a couple of times. My first year I did Ironman. I mean, I had a coach and I mean, I was in the top 5% of my age group. Yeah. No. Yeah. I worked out with a personal trainer last year and it, it I, I, I mean, it was the best workouts I've ever had. You know, I put on like 10 pounds of muscle and you know, it was great. Yeah. I see the value in it. Yeah. So it's like with anything you do, it's like, if you have a coach, you're going to do, a, you're, you're going to, you're going to get better faster. And so we're offering it free of charge for the first two weeks to all of our residents. And that's through at least 
at least the end of May. We might continue it after May just mm -hmm. because it's even if somebody doesn't pay for the service after the two weeks, we want people to we want people to succeed. We want people to recover. And I know that if they develop a, a, a morning routine, we get them dialed in with a, with a sponsor. We get them dialed in with a home group. We, we kind of get them headed in the right direction as opposed to floundering for that first couple of weeks. Like if we can get them on the right path, ASAP, like I, I know that they have the better shot. Uh -huh. Definitely. Yeah. So um, you see, you were saying your uh, occupancy or your, uh, you have some, some open beds right now, it sounds like, right? Or Yeah, yeah we've got a couple open beds. Not okay, not not bad though. Okay, so because yeah, most of your clients do fly in from other states. Just, just well, they might have come to treatment here in Phoenix, and then they come to Camelback Recovery. Or yeah, a lot. We're we're typically a step down, so people typically go to inpatient somewhere, and then after inpatient, they stay with us. And I'd say more often than not, they're they're doing uh, they're doing IOP somewhere. And then you have the. PCS, uh, which is psychological counseling services, psychological that... counseling services. Right. Yeah. And so their focus is sex addiction. So, and you kind of have a relationship with them too, right? Yeah. Okay. We have a relationship with PCS and, um, most, I mean, sex addiction is kind of what they're known for. Not, not all of their clients are sex addiction, mm -hmm. but, um, a lot of them are. Okay. Mm -hmm. So, well, you kind of had a downturn or um, you kind of planning to just kind of uh, hold off for a while and then continue expanding. What, what are your long-term plans? You know, um, I just want to, I just want to provide, I just want to provide good service. Mm -hmm. So I'd like to put more energy into coaching. I'd like to just do provide excellent service at the houses that we have open right now. I'd like to run at 80% occupancy and just, you know, provide good service and help more people. And if we, and if we, if we expand, I mean, if, and you know, eventually we will open more homes, but I want to be ready for it. I don't want to open more homes and be half full. It's, right. It, right, it's just you. too, it's just too hard. There's not enough. Yeah. We don't collect enough money to really provide the services that I'd like to provide. Sure. Yeah. So, um, well, I was thinking, you know, the, one of the differences, uh, you know, with your type of client compared to maybe someone who's going to, uh, sober house in central Phoenix, you know, and paying 150 a week, you know, these guys may have come in right off the street. They, you know, might not have any resources. So they've definitely hit a financial bottom. So do you think it's, I mean, for people who really haven't hit bottom hard financially is, is like, you know, the recognition of their powerlessness and unmanageability, is that kind of a tougher pill for them to swallow than the people who are, you know, already kind of at street level or something? Okay. Repeat the question. Okay. So I'm just, you know, like the type of client you have is probably mm -hmm. still has some resources financially. They right? have resources. So, yeah. So I guess like when you talk about bottoms, there's different types, right? You have your emotional, mental, uh, physical, and your financial. So and, you know, like a lot of the, like the places in central Phoenix or those different areas where they're, you know, the, it's maybe 150 a week, maybe less. You have people come in right in off the streets and they've definitely hit a bottom in probably all those ways. Right. Mm -hmm. Whereas a client coming into, you know, Camelback recovery still has some resources probably. Um, and so what, I mean, what's the bottom like for them if it's not financial? It's just different. I mean, like they have resources, but they can still be at a bottom. They can still sure. be emotionally and spiritually bankrupt. I sure, mean, it's right. like their wife left them. They, I mean, it's just like, there's, it's just different. You know, so, got, yeah, well, I, I work with guys who, uh, at a treatment center who are, you know, they're on state insurance. They might've been homeless if they weren't there. And a lot of them think if I just had money, my problems would be solved, right? They're sitting there in treatment thinking of, you know, if I had some money, my problems would go away. But then you have people, you know, then obviously you see like people 
coming into treatment with money and they still have the same set of problems really. Right. Yeah. They're <laughs> like having too much money is not good. Like, because then you, then you think you're better than other people. You think you're, you're smart. I mean, the people that, that come to, that come to Camelback, um, a lot of time, not always. I mean, there's more entitlement. There's, they, they still have financial resources. They think they're better than the person that it doesn't have any resources, which not always, not always. I mean, that's not, that's not always the case. It's just, it's just different. Yeah. It's just different. I mean, but there's still like, you have a lot of drug addicts and alcoholics that are, that are just lost. And just because they have, they drive a nice car and they have a good job and they make a lot of money doesn't mean that they're living a happy life. Mm -hmm. It's like, that's the, the goal really is for us to live, to be happy, joyous and free. All right. right. Yeah. And, and to find that purpose, like you found a purpose in recovery, um, you know, running the sober living, is that, that'd be one of your purposes. You probably have maybe others. I, don't, I mean, that's, but that's kind of your, your main thing right now, right? Yeah, no, it's, I mean, it's, it's just being in a business where I get to help other, other alcoholics get clean and sober. Yeah. I mean, it, it helps me getting to help other people helps me. It's just like, and, and it forever, I was selfish, self-centered Tim and it's all about Tim. And so I made decisions because, you know, you, you lie, cheat and steal to get what you want. But really when you're on the path of recovery, you learn how to, and I learned how to be honest and I learned how to be of service. And I learned how, like, I got all of the things that I really wanted because we lie, cheat and steal to get money, drugs and women. Cause we think that's going to make us happy, but that doesn't really make us happy. What that does is it leaves us empty, leaves us empty. We cause wreckage. We feel guilty. There's guilt and there's shame and there's, and when we help another alcoholic get better, if we do, if we're of service, like that's how we really get fulfillment. So how do you kind of pass that idea along to clients? You know, cause I think that's kind of a foreign concept for a lot of people entering recovery. Like, so helping you helps me. How does, I mean, like I remember that was like a strange one for me, you know? No, I, Hey man, I trust me. It took, and, and I think that's, you're not alone. Uh, I mean, and, and for me, I just was willing to take suggestions and I listened, you know, it's like they say, listen to the winners. <laughs> and I, and I looked at what all the people that were successful in their recovery and I listened to what they shared at meetings and I stayed connected to these guys and, and I kind of, you know, it's like, if I want what he wants, I have to do what he does. Mm -hmm. It just, it, it didn't, it didn't happen overnight. It didn't happen overnight. It took some time. It took time. Yeah. And that's the thing I think, you know, and for myself and other others, I can think of too, is that this thing takes longer than we think it should. Right. Like when you first come in, you're thinking, okay, I'll learn this stuff, uh, stop drinking, uh, start telling the truth and I'll be good. You know, and like, it really takes like years for like some of this stuff to really sink in, right? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, I, I remember I was planning on just getting sober for a little bit and then getting my wife off my back and then getting her back and going back to doing things that I was doing. All right. And... <laughs> Yeah, I mean, but life just continued getting better. And then I got to a year and I, I heard um, a few statistics a few months ago. So 67% of people that are able to stay sober for a year, stay sober for five years. 85% of people that stay sober for five years are able to stay sober for life. And it's like, huh. So I'm, if you can I, get to that five-year mark, your odds are, it just... 
are exponentially pretty good. Yeah. increases. Yeah. Yeah. And, yeah. and I, I, I actually don't even know where those statistics come from. I, I, I haven't even verified them, but yeah. you know, being, being around for, for nine years, I'm like, yeah, that I mean, that, sound, that out, sounds yeah. about right. That sounds about right. I mean, most people are not able to make it to a year. So really, like you got to do whatever you need to do to make it to a year. Like anybody out there that wants to get clean and sober, you got to put your ideas completely to the side. Like just listen to what other people tell you to do. Your brain Don't is not think- your friend. <laughs> yeah yeah your brain is not your friend i've never heard that before you're right like when tim's listening to tim it's not good you know i i had to listen to my sponsor i had to listen to my other friends in recovery i had to bounce things off of people and you know and as i got healthier um you know i i, I today i still need to run things by my friends but a lot but i'm i'm much better you know it's like pause when agitated or doubtful but the answers come to me more quickly today than they did back then. Absolutely. Wow. Good stuff, Tim. Um, so we're like, if anyone wants to find out more about Camelback recovery, where should they go? Uh, uh, CamelbackRecovery.com. Um, our, our Instagram, I think is at Camelback recovery. Mm-hmm. Um, Facebook Camelback recovery. 602-466-9880. That's our admissions line. Um, yeah, if you if you're looking if you're looking for uh, aftercare or coaching or anything for that matter, I mean, if there's something that we can't help you with, we can always refer you to somebody else. Um, but yeah, we've we've been open since 2014. We're we're here to stay. We're not going anywhere. We've got homes in. Scottsdale, Phoenix, the Arcadia area of Phoenix and Tucson. Nice. Nice. Okay. Yeah. And I can attest to the, uh, quality of your houses. It's, I mean, they're very, they're very comfortable. It's a nice, it's a nice lifestyle, um, for a sober living and or for any kind of living really. So, um, wow, Tim, uh, that was really great. I, um, appreciate you joining me tonight. Um, I had a lot of fun talking to you. Yeah, it was it was great, Michael. Thanks. Thanks for having me. I, I appreciate it. And um, hopefully I hopefully I said something that might help that might help somebody. All right. Yeah. Can't ask for more than that. Yeah, absolutely. All right. Tim Westbrook, ladies and gentlemen, and we're out. Have a good night. Have a good night.